All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Now, it's kind of tough because you got to read this whole book to get the entire context. But what we see here in this chapter is Solomon talking about all these great works and all these things that he's done and all this effort he's put forth and all these great projects he's accomplished and all this work that he's done. And he's just saying, you know what? It's vanity. It's all meaningless. All this work, all this effort, all these things I put forth. He says, ultimately, it doesn't matter. What's going to happen to this stuff? All these great works I built and did. Well, I'm going to pass on. It's going to go to you know, my son, who, who or the person that's going to come up after me. I don't know if he's going to be a wise man. I don't know if he's going to be a fool. He could be a fool and just, and just get all this stuff, just be destroyed, taken away, just go away. And, and ultimately, that's what's going to happen. It's all going to be destroyed as if nothing even happened. And he's saying, this is vanity and vexation. He talks about how you know, he, he sought out mirth and laughter and wine and all these other things that, that people are interested in. And um, he's like, it's, it's vanity. It's meaningless. It's kind of a depressing chapter. I'll give you that. You go through the whole book. A lot of it's depressed. You start, you start feeling a sense of hopelessness. Now you get to the end. It's not hopeless. There there's still is. It's good to have wisdom and, and it's good to have it. But we need to understand this and have this understanding that, that Solomon had about things and, and what we do with our time. What I'm preaching on this morning is how do you spend your time? Individually, I want you to think about how you spend. Think about the past week. Just this past week where, you, where you've done, what did you do this week? You know, most people, when you have a conversation, you'll say, hey, how, how are things going? How are things doing? We all have this tendency to be focused on always the positive and what's good. And, oh, well, that makes you happy, then that's good, right? And I'm not going to downplay it and say, like, oh, that's just horrible if you do something like that. Look, that's, that's normal to say, to, to be interested in people's well-being and hope that things are going well for each other. But... When we think about our time and how we spend our time, is it all just about feeling good and, and just enjoying life to the fullest of just, just going on vacation and having other people serve you and, and you know, going out to eat where people could come and serve you and then going out to another place where, where someone's going to go and entertain you and then go to, you know, is that what life is really about? Is that, is that what you think is really important? Because that stuff is vanity. And that's, what, that's why we started off here in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Those things are vain. Now, there's nothing wrong with every once in a while getting, you know, letting off some steam, relieving a little bit of stress, and, and, and being able to manage and continue. But I'll tell you what, our life is not about just going off and, and, just, and just having fun and going camping and going on trips. And all the other. That's not what life is about. That's vanity. God has put us here for a reason. We're here to work. God has a, a plan for our life. It's not just about how much can God serve us and bless us to, to just have this life full of riches and vanity. It's not what it's about. Amen. Now, I kind of made a list of, of different things that I could think of. And I, it's not going to be a complete list. But I'm trying to think of how, would, how do people in general spend their week? Just what do we do? What are the things that we do? Uh, one of the things that people do is, is spend time with entertainment or hobbies, right? People sit down, they'll watch TV, they'll watch movies, they'll listen to music, you know, maybe they'll, they'll watch sporting events, they'll do these, these types of activities, right? There's, that's one thing that people can do. Uh, another big thing is, is going to work, right? I work, I work a full-time job in addition to pastoring a church. That's something that I do and many people have a full-time job or a part-time job significant portion of our day or of our time goes into work. Um, maybe, maybe not working at a job, you could also say working in a, in a household, right? I know on Saturday is a big day for me to get chores done, to get other things done around the house, pulling weeds, cutting the lawn, you know, doing all kinds of things that need to be done. It's work, right? Maintaining your house, that type of thing. Sleeping, obviously, we all have to do that. That, that covers, I mean, we're thinking about it. We have 24 hours in a day, right? And these are all activities that, that you know, and, and I'm not saying these are all bad by any means. The whole point, and just keep this in mind as we're, as we're going through these points, because I'm going to go through them more carefully, is just to get you to think, how are you spending your time, and is it spent wisely, and is it spent according to what your priorities are in your life? Does it hold with, because we all have values in our life. We all have things that we deem to be important to us. We could read the Bible. We could read this and be like, yeah, you know what? This is God's word. This is truth. All these other things are vanity. 
But are you spending all of your time in vanity? Do you recognize that, that all of these things that he's listening to, all this work that he's doing, he's saying, you know what, but this is all vanity and vexation of spirit. It really doesn't profit anything. Are you spending a significant amount of your time or what you would consider to be an appropriate amount of your time on the things that you deem to be important? that you think are the best things that you can be doing. Because if you don't even have that, you need to start getting a priority list in your mind of what is important. What are the things that you should be focused on on a daily basis? Hey, if I don't get anything else done today, this needs to get done. Because I'll tell you what, oftentimes we'll say, and, and I'll, I'll, we have this, this, this feeling in our heart, we have this understanding that, you know what? I really need to read my Bible. It's really important. I, I, need, I need to study God's Word. I need to get in on it. But most people, when the day comes to an end, oh, I just got too busy. Oh, I got, I got other things happened. Other things came up. And this is one of the things that get pushed aside. And we're, we're going to go, th I'm, I'm not even through with my list here, but just bear with me because we only have so many hours in a day, right? And I know the older that I get, the, the faster that time gets, it's just like, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes. You're like, man, where did the day go? I can't believe it's October already. It's, it's, it, to me, it's just, it's just, man, you know, the time is just slipping away. And we don't have very much of it. We need to maximize and make the best use of our time so that when we get to the end of our life, we can look back and think, what did I do? Does it are you going to be thinking and caring, wow, I went to, to the Six Flags theme park, you know, 50 times in my life and just, and just be super happy and, and content with all the time that you spent doing that at the end of your life? Or do you think you might be thinking, what, all, you know, what did I do to help other people out? What did I do to, to further the cause of Christ? Well, you know, those are things that are going to matter a lot more. I guarantee you this. By the end of the life, those are going to be things that matter way, way, way more to you than the vanities that we could spend our time with in the present. And it's maintaining this type of an of a, of a attitude or a mindset as we go through our daily life. These are things that need to stay with us. But let's, I'm going to keep going through this. Sleep, obviously, everybody needs to sleep. No one's doubting that, right? But I'm going to keep on going here because I, I, I made a small list here. We got, I've got reading, studying, going to school maybe. You go to college, you go to school. You, you, you do some studying, you do some reading. These are things that, that could be a significant amount of time. Now, I didn't break it down to every, like, you spend five minutes doing something a day. Look, these are all trying to be significant portions of our day. Working, entertainment, sleep, reading, studying, going to school. For some people, exercising, and even driving. I know myself, I drive down to Phoenix and back twice a week. That's a significant amount of my day that's spent driving. These are all things that are common to, to most people, most people spend a lot of time in, in, in these different aspects. And again, there could be something else. You deal with that and apply that to the sermon however it, it makes sense to you. But um, compare all this with how much time do you spend with, say, going to church, praying, reading your Bible, memorizing Scripture, and preaching the gospel of Christ, doing some soul winning. Those are all things that require effort. Those are all things that, that and, and it should go without saying, these are all things that God wants us to be spending our time with. These are all things that God wants us to do. And I, I'm not going to spend the majority, I'm not going to spend the time in the sermon to prove these things to you from Scripture. If you think that they're not required of us, I will gladly show you the Scriptures after service. Just come to me. But I, I think it's pretty, pretty commonly accepted that God wants us to go to church. The Hebrew sentence says not, to forsake, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but um, you know, so much the more as you see the day approaching, as, as, as the manner of some is. Some people forsake the assembling of ourselves together. They don't go to church. They don't think it's important. And I'm not going to preach why church is so important. I've done that in previous sermons. But... Is it a priority to you? See, some people, church is just, eh, well, yeah, I got, well, you wake up Sunday morning. What am I going to do today? I don't really have anything planned. Eh, maybe I'll go to church, right? Or even worse, oh, it's Christmas. We have to go to church. Or it's Easter. We have to go to church, right? Or anywhere in between. 
here's the thing. I'll, I'll just give you a little insight. In my, when I decided that church was important, when, when I finally got right with God, I got saved when I was 20. Okay, I, I, I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when I was 20 years old as my Savior. That's the moment I got saved. But I didn't live a very Christian life for a long time after that. It took me years to get right with God. It took years before I even got baptized. And then I got into a good church and started going to church. But when I decided that, you know what? This is important for me. I need to come here. I need to learn. I need to grow. I need to do what's right. And I'm going to put a priority on this. Ever since that time, I decided, you know, I'm going to church every time there's a service. And I'm not going to let anything get in my way. And sometimes things will come up. Sometimes, you know, the boss at work will be like, hey, can you, can you work on a you know, Wednesday night? Can you work a little bit later? I'm sorry, I can't. You know, any other day, I said, I will do work for you. I can work for you after service. I could do work in the morning. I could do work all other times. I will try to work with you and do the best I can. But this is extremely important to me. I have to do this. And this is the type of priority. And look, I'm not saying this. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this to try to lift myself up and say, oh, look at me, how holy I am and how righteous I am. It's just something that I decided that was important to me. And this is something that you have to decide for yourself. Now, look, maybe church isn't that important to you. But the point that I'm making today is what is important to you and what you think. If you think it really is important, then try to make an effort and say, you know what, this might take some reorganization of my schedule. This might take some work to get to happen, but I do believe that this is really important. And every time I go to church, I learn more and I seem to grow more. I'm going to make sure I'm going to church. That you make that a priority. If, if that is something that you feel is important in your life, it's something that you think that God wants you to be doing. Prayer. As another thing, we get busy in our life and you got all these things coming out and distractions and you got a family, you got everything going on. And at the end of the night, you're like, man, I'm just so tired, I need to go to sleep. And no time is put aside for prayer. The Bible says, he that, you know, um, ask and you shall receive. It's that easy. I mean, God has such a great promise on our prayers. And, and all we have to do is go to him and cast our cares on him. Look, he'll, he's there to take care of us. He's a loving father. He wants to help us out. But we need to go to him. We need to talk to him. We need to bring concerns to him, not just for ourselves, but for others. As we were talking about earlier, that young Josiah, look, he needs help. And we see many examples in the Bible of people praying for others. As the, as the church prayed for Peter when he was locked up in prison, and God sent an angel and, and, and freed him from prison. God hears prayers and answers them. It's extremely important and is extreme, uh, there's so much power to try to gain access to the power of God through prayer because he promises, many promises uh, to us that he answers and hears our prayer. But you have that available to you. You have the Heavenly Father waiting, waiting to hear from you. And you got too busy. Too busy to, to go to him. With what? And that's, and that's the whole point I'm going to think about. With what? What is it that you do that is more important in your mind that just has to get done more than some of these things? Reading your Bible? I mean, here, just getting directly. You know, I think church is really important. I, obviously, I do. You know, I'm a pastor of a church. I think it's important. But what I think is probably even more important is getting in the Word for yourself and reading it yourself and reading and, and having, you know, prayer is where we speak to God and we talk to Him. Well, he's not going to audibly answer you. I'll tell you what, if you're hearing voices in your head and you think that's God, it's not God. The way that we're going to hear back from God, I mean, obviously he can do things and make things happen in our life, you know, and, and that could be an answer, but still, it's a silent one. But the way we hear from God is through reading his word. His, he's given us his words. This is the word of God. God's words are given to us. We need to receive them. He's already, you know, oftentimes even the prayers that we ask, he's already given us the answer. It's all in here. We need to learn that though for ourselves. It's so important to have this type of a wisdom and to make the right decisions in our life. The only way we can do that is by knowing what his word says. And we need to stay in that. Um, the Bible says, I've got a, the, uh, when Jesus Christ was confronted with the devil in the wilderness and, you know, he, he was fasting and the devil said, you know, turn these stones into bread. And what was his response? He always responds to Satan with scripture. He says, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus Christ's words, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God is how we're supposed to live. That's what, what you know, it's not just about eating food. We need to be 
be thriving in getting our sustenance from God's word. Just as much, I mean, you eat probably approximately three times a day, right? You eat a meal about three times a day. How much do you read your Bible? Are you reading your Bible three times? Are you getting that nourishment? Are you getting that feeding from God, from his word? How often are you doing that? How much time are you investing in that? Is it, is it a two-minute thing, a, like a two-minute meal? I mean, think about how, you'd be, how, how emaciated you'd be feeling and how your body would not be able to function properly if all you did was eat a two-minute meal just once a day or once a week. You'd be weak. You'd be struggling. You'd be barely surviving if surviving at all. We need to have the same view of, of, of getting God's word and his nourishment, his, his sustenance through his word in our life spiritually. Because your spirit is struggling if you're not in his word. Bible memorization and soul winning. I could go, I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get too, we should understand the importance of these things. I mean, preaching the gospel to every creature is a great commission that Jesus Christ gave. The last thing he said to his disciples before he left. Saying, look, this is what I have for you to do. This is the work I want you doing. It's a job. It's something that you know, God has committed unto us, the ministry of reconciliation. It's committed to us. It's a ministry of, of reconciling people to God, bringing the solution. Hey, this world is full of sinners. We're all sinners. We need to reconcile people unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Bring them Christ. Say, hey, look, you're in trouble. You're a sinner. You're in trouble. You've, you've got the, the law, the weight of the law. The judgment of God's law is hanging on you. But someone came to satisfy that judgment. And he's offered a free gift of salvation and it's yours. All you have to do is put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to receive that payment that he made for you and you will be saved forever. You will have eternal life. Great news. How important is that for other people? Now look, Without even going any further into these things, I, I think you should be able to see these things are important. They are very important things that we should be doing with our life. But are they a part of your life? Have any of these things been a part of your life this past week? Now, everyone that's here this morning, yes, church. You can, you can say, yes, church is a part of my life because I'm here today. But think about that. And, and look, this is all personal. This is all you to analyze your own life and what you deem to be important. How important is prayer? How important is Bible reading? How important is that to you in your mind when you stack it up against the other things that you've done, but then is you, do your actions follow through? So let's go through all these things that I mentioned earlier and, and prioritize them. And you know what? I'm not, we're not going to get a, a, a answers from everybody in the crowd. We're, I'm just going to kind of go through this stuff uh, real basically. And I'm also going to add some Bible, some scripture along with each of these things to maybe help us to prioritize how important each of these activities are that we do. Okay? We'll start off with the entertainment and hobbies and things that just, they pass the time, you get some kind of amusement, you get some kind of joy from it, some, some type of relief, stress relief, what have you, from watching a game, watching, but ultimately, I mean, think about it. If you're a real sports fanatic, does it, does it really matter? I mean, you could think it's the most important. Man, is my team going to win the Super Bowl this year? I don't know. You're all excited about it and you're into it. Say, what's going on? And people get injured and you're know, looking at other teams, everything that's going on. And it's so exciting. And, and from week to week, man, what is going to happen? I don't know. But in 10 years, is that going to matter at all? I mean, start thinking back, can, you know, and I know there's probably some sports buff that's going to be able to tell me every single team who's won for the past like, existence of the NFL or something, but <laughs> does it really matter? Does it matter in, in 1908 or 1909, whenever it was, that the Cubs won the World Series? Does that really matter wow. to anyone at all? Does it, to some people it does. It's kind of a <laughs> sore subject, right? But, <laughs> but honestly, who cares? Who cares? It doesn't mean anything. Do you think God's up in heaven caring about people who are carrying a, a pigskin down a field or, or you know, slack, you know, hitting a, a golf ball into a hole or, or whatever? Okay? These things don't mean anything. And it, watching a movie, watching a sitcom, what, whatever, it's meaningless. It, it, it really doesn't add any value to life. It's something that you do. Again, you might get a little bit of stress relief you know, or video games, anything, any of this type of stuff. It's just vanity. 
It's mirth. It's worldly pleasures. And when we started off in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he says in verse 1, he said, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. Enjoy pleasure. All these things are about this enjoying pleasure, right? It's pleasant. It's pleasurable. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? So what good is it? But how much of your time do you spend during the week occupying your time with this type of stuff? How much? I mean, think about it for yourself. How, how much? If you were to add up your hours and, and keep that in mind. Because to me, entertainment and hobbies is really low on my priority list. It's really low. It's, 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 a, it's something that, that I will use because if I am just working, 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 working so hard and you just feel like I need to get my mind off of this onto something else before I just go insane, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take 20 minutes or 30 minutes or something for, for, for a little bit of entertainment, for a little bit of, of downtime. My wife likes to call it downtime, right? Something where, where you can just unwind and, and just relax a little bit. I don't think it's sinful or wrong to have that type of a time. But when you think about your own priorities, where does that stand? I mean, are you spending so much time on it that, it, that an outsider would say, wow, that must be the most important thing in your life? Because you're spending, you know, four hours a day just watching TV and movies and stuff and just, just being entertained. Work. Okay, work, like working at a job or housework. I think these are both pretty important. Um, obviously, you know, like, like for a man, when I go out and do my work, the Bible says that, that I need to provide for my own. I need to provide for my household. The Bible says if, if a man does not provide for his own, he's worse than an infidel. So in Scripture, it's pretty important that I am providing for my, for my family and that I am doing work. But at the same time, the Scripture also says in Proverbs 23, verse 4, labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own understanding. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. So if you're working to provide for your family, that is scriptural. That is what you should be doing. That is something that, that needs to have time devoted to it. And it is an important thing. Obviously, I need to make sure that my children are all fed and clothed. And, and my wife is, is, is provided for scripturally that is extremely important but if i continue to work and just say you know what i'm just going to keep working and working and working and working so that we can get more cars and boats and and treasures and things and and all this stuff that i could accumulate unto myself to have in in, in this present life he's saying don't labor to be rich don't be spending so much time that you're working so hard because look if i wanted to i can do that i could i could invest work 80 hours a week, you know, or more, 100 hours a week, and just invest in, in working to make money. And I'm pretty confident I'd be successful at it. I think I can do it. But that's not my priority at all because it's vanity. It's meaningless. But a lot of people out there, they're spending their time doing it. And you, you could look at the lives of these really powerful CEOs of these, these large corporations. And you know, the vast majority of them, they worked really, really hard to get to the point where they're at. And I've, I've heard interviews and read books and these people talk about, yeah, but I've, they've made a lot of sacrifices in their life. And what they've sacrificed, I have a very high priority on. They sacrifice things like family and having children and doing other things with your time as opposed to just working and grinding all the time. And this is what the Bible is warning us. God's word is warning us about don't labor to be rich. Don't get, don't get wrapped up into that. It's vanity. Riches make themselves wings as eagles. It just flies away. It could just be gone in a second. Look what happened when the stock market crashed. I mean, so many of these people that all they've been doing is working for money got destroyed overnight. Riches make themselves wings. They'll fly away. But work is important. So we need to keep that proper balance. When, 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 you're, when we're trying to determine what is important, where our priority is at, yeah, I believe that's important. That is a very high priority for me only to the sense where I'm providing. Above and beyond that, the priority drops. Um, I think doing work around the house is also equally important, especially for my wife. Her job is to, to be a keeper at home and, and to make sure everything's prepared for here, make sure the meals are cooked, make sure the children are taught, make sure the house is in order, and all these other things. 
They are important also. Uh, turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Because we're, we're looking at our priorities and what are we setting as a priority. And I want you to see this story in Luke chapter 10 about Martha. Martha is someone who is real concerned about doing the, 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 the tasks and the work that, that she was to be doing as, you know, and providing for people and, and serving and, and, doing, you know, and doing the cleaning and all this other stuff. But there came a time where Jesus is basically saying that that's not that important right now. There's a lot of work to be done. I get that. But right now there's something that's more important. And in Luke chapter 10, we're going to look at verse number 38. Luke chapter 10, verse number 38, the Bible reads, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And, as, and, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. So Martha and Mary, they're sisters, and Jesus comes into their house. And Martha's all worried and busy about serving, you know, getting everything prepared. I'm going to bring some meal. I'm going to do all this other stuff. And I'm doing all this work around the house. He's saying, you know, Jesus, Mary's just sitting there. You know, tell her to come and help me out. I need help in the kitchen. Get, bring, get her back here. I need some help. But look at Jesus' response to her. Verse 41, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. He's saying, you know what? I'm here in your house. The words and the things that I have to tell you and the things that I'm saying are so much more important to you right now than, than the work that you're doing in your kitchen. He says, this is needful for you. You need to hear this. Look, I know you've got these other things going on, this other work, but he's saying right now, the priority should be on listening to me and what I have to say to you. And Mary has chosen that part. She's sitting down here saying, like, I don't care if the dishes are stacked up. Jesus is here. I'm going to listen to what he has to say. Now look, it's, you know, Martha had, had, a, had a good heart. She's trying to serve. She's trying to do all this stuff, and, but, but she's getting too distracted on the things that aren't as important. They're not as needful. What's needful, and what Jesus is explaining here, this is the priority. Get the wisdom from my words. Listen to me, especially while I'm here in your house. I mean, think about that today. Now, if Jesus were to come into your house, would you be worried about any of the other things you have to do? I'm not going to be worried about shoveling those, those, those wood chips that are out in my backyard that have been there for months. If Jesus were to walk in my house, I'd be like, well, hold on a minute, Jesus. I got, I got all this work to do. Can you just get some more workers for me to help me get this stuff done? And then I'll come and sit down and listen to you. No, of course not. That would be crazy. It would be ridiculous, right? And this is essentially what he's trying to explain. Now, we have Jesus. We have the mind of Christ right here. We have his words. We may not have him physically sitting down with us, but we do have his words. Are you cumbered about much other things in your life. Too cumbered to sit down and listen to the words of Christ. Keep that in mind. It's just, just, these are things we're trying to get wisdom from God's word. Turn, if you would, back to Proverbs. We're going to look at a few verses in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6. It gets right after the book of Psalms. you got the big book of Psalms in the middle and then right after that is the book of Proverbs. Six. six, yes. Chapter 6 of Proverbs. <clears throat> I mentioned sleep. Okay? It goes without saying. We need sleep. Our bodies need sleep in order to be healthy, in order to, to continue and to perform at our maximum and to be efficient at doing what we're doing and to be the best worker that we can. If we're going to do work for God, hey, our, our bodies need to be healthy and one of the ways that they're going to be healthy is getting enough rest. Rest is needful. But we don't want to get to the point to where we're getting 
lazy or we're being a sluggard, we're being someone who's just sleeping all the time. Look, this is how I was back in high school. I'll, be, I'll, I'll confess my faults, okay? Back when, in my younger days, man, I, I could sleep on a Saturday until like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And I loved it. But what a waste of time. And it's not because I went to bed at 4 in the morning, okay? <laughs> I wasn't sleeping until 1 because I went to bed at 4, you know, getting like you know, 8 or 9 hours of sleep. I went to bed in all time and I just I would just sleep in. I'd wake up and be like, nope, going back to sleep. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, look at verse number 9. It says, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. And he's saying, Look, how long are you going to sleep for? You keep sleeping, you're going you're gonna to end up in the poorhouse because you're not, I mean, it's, it's a good sign. It's showing that you're not a worker. You're not getting up and working and doing the work that you need to do. Poverty is going to come on you. It's a warning. Now flip over to Proverbs 31. And I know everybody's body and everybody's, you know, depending on your age and where you're at, there's different levels that are appropriate for you for sleep. And again, you figure that out for yourself. But what the point I'm trying to make here is don't let sleep become one of those things where it's just like, it's just overtaking you and, and you're, you're spending way too much time literally doing nothing because you're sleeping. I mean, zero benefit at all. Once, you, once you've gotten the rest that you need, that your body needs to be healthy, that's what you need. Don't, don't overindulge. It's, it's kind of like overindulging in food or overindulging in, in, in anything. Uh, it, it can happen with sleep also. Okay? But look at Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 is, is this, uh, the story of the virtuous woman. It's a passage real popular about the virtuous woman. The woman who does all these things and she's, and she's highly exalted as being very virtuous, very good, very godly woman. I want to point out two verses to you about the virtuous woman, about, about this woman who's so godly. Verse 15 says, She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. It's saying she's getting up before dawn to get her day started, to get the food ready, to, get, to make sure all of her household is taken care of. She's getting up before dawn and then jump down to verse 18 because it goes on about some other things that she does and, and the other work that she spends during the day. Verse 18, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She's working then into the night. She said her candle's not going out. She's still doing more work. And it talks about how she's making clothing for her household. So, you know, in the morning, she's getting up early. But she's not even going to bed when the sun goes down. She's staying up. Her candle's not going out. Now, of course, she's sleeping. She's getting rest. But she's getting what's needed. And no more. She's getting up early. She's staying up late. She's doing the things that need to get done. And saying, okay, well, you know, and again... Decide it for yourself, but, but I don't think, you know, we, we live, we live in, a, in kind of a, a culture where especially the younger, the younger the generations are coming up are so much more used to being coddled. And, and I mean, any little uh, uh, offense that someone might say is a big deal, is blown up, or, or a little pain or discomfort... It's like, it's like kids are being raised to just, just have nothing negative whatsoever, feeling anything going on in your life. And if there is, oh, it's such a huge deal. Look, you work, you get tired. Sometimes you get cuts and bruises and scrapes. And, you know, I try to teach us. It's funny watching, watching the grandparents with my kids because, you know, my oldest is, is not quite six yet and she's learning how to ride a bike. And they geared her up. They've got all the, the pads, elbow pads, knee pads, shin pads, you know, the helmet. And it's like she's going off to war or something. It's like she's just going to ride a bike. <laughs> and, and I think it's super funny. And then, you know, she might fall down and the grandparents are like, oh, no, are you okay? Is everything? You know, it's like, she's fine. I tell her, she's got to learn how to, how to fall. And to make mistakes. And you know what? Sometimes it's going to hurt. Do I want my child just getting like, extremely injured and, and everything? No, of course not. Of course not. But she also does have to learn. They, they all have to learn that sometimes in life when you try to do things, you're going to fall down. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to get scraped up, scratched up, bruised up, and it's not going to feel good. But you're going to get past it. It's really ultimately not that big of a deal. 
And it's something that needs to be learned. And it's just one of those things. You know, hey, a little bit of sleep. You go without sleep a little bit for a night. Okay, so I'll be a little bit tired. But guess what? I'm going to keep up and just keep working. That's the way I look at it. But again, prioritize. Is it making priorities in your life? Because sleep is something that if you could replace, if you're sleeping 10 hours a day, I mean, you can add two hours. Say like eight hours a day is supposed to be, you know, one of the, one of the you know, right? I, I don't get eight hours of sleep a day, but let's say, you, I mean, if you were sleeping 10 hours a day, you cut that down to, to eight, that's two full hours that you get to add to your day every single day. I mean, two, think about what you could do with two full hours that you weren't doing before. Uh, some that, that time I didn't have before, now I've got two hours. I can read my Bible for two hours a day now. Just by cutting that, just by changing that one aspect of my life. I mean, whatever the case may be. Reading, studying, going to school, all these things. Now again, I'm not saying these things aren't important either. Sleep is important. Work is important. Entertainment is not important. I will say that. A priority, that is the lowest priority. Work is pretty important. Sleep is important. It's a high priority. But again, just as with work, there's a, there's a balance. Once you get past that certain threshold, all of a sudden, boom, this isn't important anymore. Reading, studying in school, again, I'm going to say a similar thing. But, you know, the Bible warns us, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Um, turn, if you would, to, to James chapter 4. I'll read for you for 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 18, 19, and 20 read, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. We're seeing more vanity in just amassing the knowledge of the wisdom of this world. Right? I, I've known people who are like, like lifetime students at university where they just, they just say, I just want to keep learning. And they're going to classes, and that's all they do. Just going to classes, going to classes, going to classes, learn about all these different subjects and all these different things. That's vanity. Okay, learning the, the wisdom of the world. Now look, if you need to get, you know, I, I'm not against education at all, being educated in things, and, and being, being able to, to understand concepts and, and to, to be educated in different, you know, in different areas. But it seems like you know the, the most important thing that we need to be spending our time, the, 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 the most important wisdom you could have is literally the Word of God. Not just the, word, not the wisdom of the world, but God's wisdom. If you get these things out, you can be successful in your life if you really get down the wisdom of God's Word and you really don't have much of the wisdom of the world because if you get God's wisdom down, your character, your work ethic, all these other aspects will be right and you will be doing a good job. You'll be serving whoever it is. Like you go out to get a job, you, will be, you should be the hardest worker on that job and you should be able to, to advance and be, you know, even in the, the world might consider to be successful in that regard of, of being able to provide for yourself and providing for your household and you'll do the things that are necessary in order to do that stuff and to achieve that if when you have this wisdom down first. I'm not against education or learning. I, I, I love to learn. I love to read new things and, and, and do this stuff. But what's the value? What are you getting back out of it? What's the, what's the priority in your life? Um, exercise. The Bible says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Exercise, it's important. It says, Bodily exercise profiteth little. Which means it does profit. There is a profit to exercising. There is a profit to keeping your body healthy. Again, as we mentioned, with sleep keeps your body healthy. Eating right keeps your body healthy. There is an importance for that. Exercising, keeping your body healthy is important. But to the point to where you're all about exercise, I mean, there's people that spend literally, I mean, just, just almost the majority of their day in the gym. And, and just, just doing, you know, four hours a day, five hours a day, six hours a day in the gym. Three hours in the morning, three hours at night. That's excessive. <laughs> so the Bible says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Again, showing the importance. What is more important? Godliness. That is where the emphasis should be. Um, and I, I have uh, driving on here, you know, 
Um, obviously, there, there's certain times where, where that's important. I don't think most people drive just to drive, just to just for the fun of it. But the, one of the reasons why that's in here then is because as you analyze how much time you spend on these different things, and you start to realize, well, it doesn't look like I have a priority on the things that I think I have a priority on. There are areas, if you would get a little creative, it doesn't even take much, where you can start adding in the time to do some of these other th things that you do think are important. For example, I'll start with the driving. One of the ways that I spend my driving time is I have the Bible on audio, and I listen to that on my dialogue. For me, the drive is required in order to keep my job, in order to maintain my full-time job that I use to support my family with, I need to make that, that drive twice a week. The my only other option would be to get a different job somewhere else that requires less driving. And, and the, the value is not worth it. I'm getting all the details on that because it doesn't really matter. That's my situation. And whatever your situation is, you have your situation. There are times that you could spend driving. Instead of just listening to the radio and just listening to pop songs and, and the, the music that the devil puts out there to distract you, Get the Bible on audio. You know what? If you want, we have the Bible on audio up here, and I'll give it to you for free. It's yours. The entire Bible, an MP3, is yours if you want it. And that is one way where you could start increasing the time that you spend getting God's Word on, on a daily basis or however often that you drive. Um, exercising. Even if you do ex hey, bodily, profit, bodily exercise profiteth little, you can exercise. And I was doing this too for a little while. I, I kind of stopped my exercise routine, but I was spending about, I don't know, 20 minutes uh, in the morning doing, like we have exercise bike and stuff, whatever equipment that the dogs have just completely chewed up now. But I was <laughs> using that time with my Bible open and you could do some like scripture memory or something like that. You print off a little, little piece or write down an index card. And while you're, while you're, you know, working away or doing whatever, just, just take a little flash card. You can start memorizing Bible that way. It's incorporating it into your routine of doing other things. That's a way that you could start by the end of the day. You could say like, okay, yeah, well, I read my Bible in the morning. I, I listened to it in the car. I was, when I went to the gym and started exercising, I was getting scripture that way too. And start incorporating this into the events that you do where you can do those things. Some people have jobs where it doesn't require a lot of, now, now, uh, you know, mine, I can't do this with, but some people have jobs where it's not very mentally taxing. Yeah, yeah. And you can do things like, like be praying or be doing, um, you know, Bible memory or, some, uh, or things like that on the job where it's not really going to impact. I mean, you're just like pounding nails or something. You're going, you know, you're doing a job where it's really not that mentally taxing. Um, those are the types of things. Doing housework. I know, like my wife does, does housework throughout the day. She could be just playing the, the Bible on, on audio again while, while she's going around doing her thing. Now, are you going to listen to every single word all the time? No, sometimes you get distracted, but so what? So what? Don't let that bother you. Just pick up wherever, it, oh, okay, well, I wasn't paying attention for that time. It's, you know, I do that in the car sometimes. Sometimes people, you know, things come up and it takes my attention. I, you know, I, I need to be focused because someone just cut me off. I need to, you know, make sure I'm not getting in an accident. Okay, well, whatever. For, for a little while, I'm not going to be paying attention to what's going on on the radio, on, on the, you know, on the audio. But then things are settled down. Okay, now I'm back to driving again. Normal. Oh, yeah, I'm going to listen up. Where, where are we at now? No big deal. And just keep on getting God's word that way. Um, <clears throat> It's up to you, obviously, to, to prioritize what you think is important. What we don't want to do is, is have this attitude like we'll see here in James chapter 4, where we have this heart that says, I want to serve God, I want to do more. Next, you know, tomorrow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change things. Or next week, I'm going to change. Next year, I'm going to do so much more. You know, I, as soon as I get all this other stuff de dealt with in my life, then... I'm going to serve God way much more and just kind of put this serving God and doing what God wants me to do way out there because it'll never happen. It doesn't happen. Look at James chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible reads, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, 
we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So he, he's bringing up these people who say, yeah, you know, to, tomorrow we're going to go into the city. We're going to be there a year. We got all these great plans. We're going to get this great gain. We're going to do all this stuff. Tomorrow, we're going to do all this stuff. And he's saying, you don't know what the day is going to bring. Basically saying, don't worry about all the, all the great things you're going to do in the future. He says, you need to do it today. You, you've got today. You don't know if you have tomorrow. You need to start doing these things today. And he says at the very last verse of verse 17, to him that knoweth to do good. If you know that you should be doing these things, you know you should be doing good. You know this is what God wants you to do. You know God wants you praying. You know God wants you reading about. You know God wants you doing these things and you don't do it. He says, you know to do those things, it's a sin. There are sins of commission and there are sins of omission. Commission is you're committing a trespass against God. You're, you're breaking a commandment in the sense that God says, don't, don't commit adultery. And then you go and commit adultery. You're, you're, that's a sin of commit. You're, you're actually going and breaking that law by doing something contrary. When a sin of omission is you're not doing something. And because you're not doing it, it's a sin. This is one of those things. That if you know to do good, you know it's to do right. You see somebody here, you have a conversation with them, you know that God wants you to preach the gospel to them and you know this, but you just don't do it. The Bible says that's a sin. You know to do good. You know you should be doing that. You know you should be grasping this opportunity. But you're not doing it. You're resisting what God has for you to do. The Bible says that's a sin. So you have to ask yourself, does your daily schedule reflect what you consider to be important? Most people's don't. Honestly, most people's don't. We, we all have a tendency to want to do things more than actually following through and doing them. And I'll admit this. Look, I have lots of plans and things that I want to do with my time and with my energy. Now, I don't think I'm just completely failing because there's a lot of stuff that I, that I don't have in my life. But look, it's not about me. It's about you. What is it that you have? Where is your heart, first of all, and then say, where are my priorities? Are my priorities matching my time spent? Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's some things you could probably do if you would think about it where you can just eliminate some aspects of the things that you do that you're wasting time on in your life. There's probably things, if you were to think about it, I, you know what, I don't ever need to do this. Who cares? It doesn't matter. For me, personally, one of those things is, is little video games. You know, everybody's got their, their smartphones and all these apps and stuff, and everyone's got their faces, and, I, and I, it drives me nuts. People have their faces just always buried in their, in their device and just always just doing things on their device, and that's what they're spending their time on. But it's like, for what? You're wasting so much time. It's, you know, you're becoming a zombie by just staring at a screen all the time. I mean, people literally like walk out in public and like don't take their eyes off of their little device. Like you're around people, man. Come on. You know what? Look at what you're doing. And these days now, like I don't even know. You know we, we have a traditional family dinner. I say, you know what? Dinner is important. Dinner is a time we all come together and I, there is not going to be anybody answering the phone. There are no text messages. There are no video games. There is nothing going on when we sit down for dinner because that's important. But these days, you see couples going out to restaurants together to have like a romantic dinner and they're both on their devices and they're taking pictures and like putting on Facebook. Like, enjoy your time together. I mean, your whole point of you going out is to spend time together, right? Like, treat that other person with respect. I know I'm going off on a rabbit trail now, but this is kind of, kind of burns me up a little bit, so sorry for the little rant, but, but when people just have this attitude, it's like, show respect for the people that you're with. You're spending time with that person. <sighs> when I was growing up, you know, nobody had cell phones. You, you know, there was a phone on the wall, and if, if you weren't home, you didn't answer the phone <laughs> because you're out doing something. So who cares? Then cell phones came around, people would get them, like, well, just in case there's an emergency. Yeah, it's a good idea, right? And now it's just like, talk all the time, everywhere you're going. You'd be having a meeting with someone. Someone's like, oh, hold on a second, I gotta get this call. Look, 
Whatever you're doing, just spend your time doing that and don't worry. Don't get so cumbered about all these things that are about you. But off of that, because I don't want to, I'm getting, I'm getting off track here. There are things that you could probably do to free up your time immediately. I guess it, for me, it was a video game thing where video games are stupid, meaningless, do nothing. And I'll play those games, they take like a minute to play or something and then be done with it. But then it's like, you play one, two, three, four, five, and after a while you're starting to get addicted to it. It's like, nope, get that out of there. It's a waste of time. Um, but for you, it may be anything else. Um, the other thing, though, besides that, we need to just be diligent to maintain the proper focus. Maintain your priorities in your mind. Make sure that you know um, what is important to you and that you're thinking about these things as your day goes on and that you're not allowing other distractions to take over your life and to take over all of your time. The Bible says in James 1, were, are you in James already anyways? Were you in James 4? Look at, flip over to chapter 1. <laughs> Flip over to chapter 1. I'm closing with these verses. We're almost done. I'm just going to close with these last verses. Of, uh, hopefully, you know, we could have this same heart and mindset and attitude. James 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. He's saying, look, God is going to give you liberally in abundance. You ask God for wisdom, look, he'll answer that prayer. But if you don't have any time set aside for prayer, when are you going to ask God to give you more wisdom? When are you going to ask God to, to help you to, to make wise choices? God's ready. He said, I will give it to you liberally. I will give you wisdom. But it says, let him ask of God. Ask. He's waiting. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, you don't have to turn if you don't want to. It has the Beatitudes, right? It's blessed, blessed are the poor, you know, blessed are the meek, so they shall inherit the earth. And all, and all those blessed are. One of my favorite ones is in verse 6. It says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I love the language used. They that hunger and thirst after, they, they, this, is, this describes a person who wants to do what's right. Someone who is hungering and thirsting and just set and focused on doing what's right by God. He said, if you hunger and thirst and that is set as a priority for you and that's in the forefront of your mind and this is what you want to do, the Bible says you'll be filled. Matthew 5, verse 6. Matthew 5, 6. But again, it comes down to priorities. If your priority is doing right by God, hey, make that a focus to the point to where you're hungering and thirsting after that. This is, I have this desire to, to, to do what's right and to know the truth and, and, to, and to do what God has for me to do to the point to where I'm just hungering and thirsting after that. God says, I'll fill you. I will do that. And I'll be honest with you, there are people that, that I believe wholeheartedly when we go out and talk to people on the street, we go out and knock doors, randomly, we go out, we're randomly to us, we go out and knock on doors and we talk to people. How many times we run into people where they say, wow, well, this is a real weird coincidence. I was just praying last night that God, you know, that, that, that God could, could show me, you know, like, uh, what you know lead me to the right church or to do this or to do that and, and I said you know it's not a coincidence you, when when people are seeking and asking God for the truth and for knowledge and then we show up and we have the gospel of Jesus Christ and show this is how you get saved I don't think that's a coincidence I think God has that plan well, it seems random to us but I think God has it worked out to where we're there at that time because they are seeking God. They want to know and they honestly want to know what the truth is. They want to know what God is and you know what? God says, okay, I'll answer that for you. It works and it, it's in the Bible. I don't believe that Jesus was lying when he said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. When he said that they shall be filled. I don't think Jesus Christ is a liar. I will hold him to that. Say, so you know what? I am hungry and thirsty after this. God, show me. Jesus, show me. You said I'm going to be filled. Fill me. And having that type of an attitude. Hey, if we could have that and, 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 and just keep, as we, as we leave today, as we start our week tomorrow, as we do the things that we do, take notice of, your, of the things in your life. Take notice of it. Maybe even write down a plan. I mean, get motivated to say, I want to do more. 
and make it happen. Make that change in your life. It's not going to happen by itself ever. The easy thing to do is to not do anything that's right. The easy thing is to never read your Bible. It's harder. You need to put forth the effort to get these things done. Decide for yourself, where's my priority at and how much time am I going to invest and spend on the things that are a priority to me. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the truth, dear Lord. We thank you just for the abundance of blessings and the, and, the, and the opportunities at our fingertips, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to redeem the time for the days that are evil. Help us to, to use the time you've given us. We don't know how long we have in this life. We don't know when you're going to call us home. I'm going to take advantage of every single moment of my day. And I am going to going to do the things that, that need to be done, of course, physically speaking, dear Lord, but I'm going to make sure that I do the things that are important and the things that you have laid out for us to do. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.